So um, we were talking about dimension. And um, I had introduced uh, finite morphisms. which we wanted to use to study dimensions. So um, if I, this was, uh, for us finite morphisms were morphisms of a fine variety. So if x and y are fine varieties, uh -huh. and f from x to y is finite, is defined to be finite if and only if the um, if I take the pullback, so the coordinate ring of X is a finite um, so F star of A of Y algebra. Then I had introduced what this means. So it means that uh, so if uh, F A and B K algebras Uh, then, uh, so one is a subalgebra of the other. Then we say that B is a finite as an A algebra if, well, it's the analog of a finite dimensional vector space over A. So if uh, there exist some elements, finitely many B1 be n in B such that uh, B can be written as um, linear combinations of these elements with coefficients in A. We had given some characterizations of that. So if uh, B over, uh, or some, some properties, so if C over B is finite and B over A is finite and C over A is finite, and we had some similar results. And we had seen that being finite also has something to do with, uh, uh, so if, uh, <coughs> uh, so one result that we had that if uh, uh, B over A is finite, then um, every element of B satisfies a monic equation. with coefficients, so it's a zero of a monic equation with coefficients in A. And so, um, yeah, maybe that is, um, and then we finally, uh, then we had come back to, uh, now that we had studied this, we had then come back to this definition and we had proven that finite morphisms are closed. So now we want to go forward. So um, so maybe I um, <clears throat> we want to uh, we want to study these finite morphisms to somehow study dimension. So it's somehow important that we have enough uh, finite morphisms, and so that we. <clears throat> um, for instance, if um, we want a n to have dimension n, we will prove that in a moment. Uh, and then we want to use this to compute the dimension of any variety. So uh, if we can use finite morphisms to compare the dimensions, then it would be good if we know that every, say, a fine variety has a finite morphism to some a n. And that's actually what is called the Noether normalization theorem. So that uh, we can compare. So up to a finite, so there's always a finite morphism from any affine variety to some a n. So let's 
this is, uh, and this will be a very important tool for us. So we have the theorem, which is the neutral normalization theorem. So we prove a little bit more. So let uh, set f in the n we see a hypersurface. So f is a polynomial in x1 to xn, maybe irreducible. Uh, then there exists a finite surjective morphism from a set of f to a n minus 1. Okay. So if later we prove that finite subjective morphisms preserve dimension, and then this will hopefully show that the dimension of a hypersurface in AN is the same as the dimension of AN minus 1, and that will maybe help us to show that the dimension of AN minus 1 also is N minus 1. We'll see that later today. So, and more generally, if X is in a fine variety, So then there exists a finite subjective morphism from, uh, say, phi from, <coughs> maybe also called p, p from x to a k for some k. Okay, <clears throat> so um, so we want to prove that it requires some work. First, we will prove some very simple remark, which will which we'll use in the proof of the first part, which is so obvious that uh, I maybe wouldn't even need to prove it, but it uh, anyway. So let f be a non-zero polynomial x1 to xn. Um, and um, so then, well, then there exists a point P in an with uh, f of P different from zero. Now, in some sense, that's pretty obvious, but uh, <clears throat> I still want to prove it because it actually does even take a little bit of effort. So, so if n is equal to 0, this is obvious, because in that case, we just, uh, uh, this is just a, a constant, the constant is either 0 or not. Now, if n is equal to 1, then we know we are over an algebraically closed field, so we can write uh, f of x equal to x minus b1 to the n1 x minus say bl to the nl where the bi are some elements in k and the ni are positive. And you just add fact factors into you know, linear polynomials because k is algebraically closed. So thus uh, the zero set of f just consists of these points, b1 to bl. And um, so we take any point b in k without b1 to bl, then f of b is different from 0. And why can we do this? As k is algebraically closed, it's infinite. k is infinite because an algebraically closed field will always be infinite. And so certainly, if we take away these finitely many points, there will be still some. So now comes the actual, do we have a dry one? Yeah. What? 
Now, now comes the case n is greater than 1. Here I assumed n is equal to 1 because the proof was in dimension 1. Now we look at the general case n is bigger than 1. Now n So it is somehow induction on n, but we also we need the case n equal 1 uh, in the induction. So that's why it's a bit strange. So we can write uh, f to be some i f i x n to the i. Where fi is some polynomial kx1, xn minus 1. No? And we assume that f is not 0, so that means that not all the fi are 0. So there is an i, there's a j, such that fj is not 0. I mean, as a polynomial, it's not zero. So by induction on n, we find that there is some uh, tuple of you know, b1 to bn minus 1, such if, that I put it into this fj, it will be non-zero. such that uh, fj of b1 to the n minus 1 is different from 0. So then we can make a, pol a new polynomial. We just take g of a variable x is just defined to be f of b1 to bn minus 1 comma x. So this is not the zero polynomial because, you know, after all, there is one coefficient which is non-zero. So this is in kx without zero. But it's a non-zero polynomial, and so it has a zero. It has a, it has a, uh, there's a point where it's not zero. So, so thus there exists a B in K such that G of B is different from zero. That is F of B1 to Bn minus one comma B is different from zero, B. Okay, so it was in the end not so difficult, but anyway, so we have found uh, always a point where it's not zero. So now we come to the actual, uh, we start with the actual proof. So we will um, just go about and start with number one. Okay. So we want to prove that this is finite surjective morphism. So <clears throat> we have our polynomial f. So we take the top degree homogeneous part of f. So the, uh, it's a big F. So we <clears throat> you know, test some decomposition into homogeneous components. We take the one of highest degree. So this will be some non-zero polynomial. So this is, so this is in particular, F of D is in particular homogeneous. 
So if we put the last variable, xn, to be 1, it will not be the zero polynomial. You know, if you just look at it, if you put, take a homogeneous polynomial, you put one variable equal to one, you have precisely as many terms as before. No terms cancel. So if the polynomial was not zero before, it's not zero afterwards. No? You can get back the previous polynomial by just homogenizing. So this is not zero. So in particular, we can use this... Uh, Stupid remark. So thus there exists uh, say B1 to Bn minus 1 in, uh, you know, An minus 1 such that if I take Fd of B1 so the n minus 1, comma 1, this is different from 0. Okay? So this is uh, what this stupid remark was useful for. Now, we can change the coordinates on our a n. We just shift everything, you know, all the coordinates. The first coordinate, we replace x1 by x1 minus b1 x2 by x2 minus b2, and so on. So by shifting the coordinates, we can assume that b1 to be n minus 1 is actually 0. No? So by a change of coordinates, assume that uh, fd of 0, 0, 1 is different from 0. Now, <clears throat> when we, so the f that we use to, uh, for this hypersurface is well defined only up to multiplying by a non zero constant. You know, the zero set does not change if we multiply it by a non zero constant. So this is some non zero number. We can as well assume that this number is 1. So by multiplying uh, f by a constant, you can assume fd is equal to 1. But what does it mean? It just means that, <clears throat> so if you have a polynomial, uh, a, hom you know, a homogeneous polynomial in, in these variables x1 to xd. So these are all, all the monomials have degree d. So <coughs> there's only one monomial of degree d which will give you 1 if you put only the, the nth variable equal to 1, all the other ones equal to 0. All the other ones give you 0. So this statement just means uh, equivalently that the coefficient of um, x n to the d in either f d or in f is 1. OK. OK, so this is what we, <clears throat> and you know, this should make you think of what we had about uh, these um, uh, these finite maps, there was something that in algebra is finite over another one. So if you, um, so if you add an element which satisfies a monic polynomial to some algebra, then the extension is finite. So here we, it looks like we might get there. Let's see how it works. So, so let now we take this projection P from 
um, say ZF. So P as a projection, we just take the projection to the first given by the first n minus one coordinates. So we just, uh, you know, take the first n minus one coordinates of every point. Um, and we let, um, say, Wn in the coordinate ring of Zf to be the class of the last variable. So then I claim that, so maybe I claim that A of ZF will be the pullback of uh, K X1 to Xn minus 1, a joint. omega n, I mean the extension, the k-algebra extension like this. Because after all, you know, the, the A of Zf is just the quotient of kx1 to xn by uh, the ideal of this thing. So it's generated by the classes of x1 to xn. So the the pullback just pulls back the class of x the xi, you know, on the n minus one to the class of xi in here. So this is okay. And the, the last one, the xn, is pulled back to this one. So it's really, the, we find that the coordinate ring of zf is just this. No? Because this says nothing else than it is the ring generated by the classes in az zf of the xi. But now we see that this omega n satisfies a monic equation. No? So, so we know that the coefficient of xn to the d in f is 1. So f is equal to xn to the d plus sum i equals 1 to d minus 1 a i x n to the i, where the a i are some polynomials in k x 1 to the x n minus 1. No, that's just what it says, that the, leading, that the coefficient is this. But what does it mean if we now, you know, the... <coughs> In ZF, we just take, um, maybe I want to still keep the statement. So, <clears throat> so we have that A of ZF is equal to K X1 to Xn divided by idea generated by F. So we have in, thus in uh, A of ZF, we have a relation um, that F is zero, no? the class of F is zero in A of ZF, so that zero is equal to omega N, no, WN to the D plus sum i equals 1 to d minus 1. Well, the pullback of the ai times omega n to the i. So we have a monic equation. So this implies, so <clears throat> we have precisely the statement that this thing is obtained from this 
by adding uh, an element which satisfies the monic equation and we had the lemma which said that under these assumptions under these if one has this then this one is finite over this that is pi from zf to a n minus 1 is finite. Okay, so we have found that indeed we have a finite map like this. So now we come, um, <clears throat> now surprisingly the, um, ah, we are not finished because we are supposed to show that it's a finite surjective morphism. Okay, so we have to see why this map is subjective, but that's kind of easy. So show uh, that pi is subjective. So we take a point E1 to be n minus 1 in uh, a n minus 1, and we have to show that the fiber of it is non empty. So, uh, you know, to see is not empty. <coughs> so we put, it's uh, kind of similar to what we had before, we put Cg to be. Uh, the polynomial where we, uh, so we take f and we replace the, the first coordinates by these. So g of x. So it's some polynomial. <laughs> and we know, so we know that the coefficient of x to the xn to the d of f is, is 1. So that implies that um, this polynomial is not 0. is not affected by okay so the coefficient of x to the x to the d of this polynomial is one so um, and is well is not zero and actually it's non-constant because the coefficient, as I said, of x to the d is non-zero. So therefore, g has a zero. Say b in k. Well, and then uh, obviously, <laughs> if this has a zero, then this is a zero of this thing. So we have a, a thus, um, we have that the inverse image of uh, this point, ah, this was B, so we will call it A. So the inverse image of, um, uh, B. No, we have a point, we have to show, you know, it's subjective, so we have to show for every point, the inverse image is not zero, but it was certainly not written very prettily. So, um, so this inverse image, pi to the minus 1 of b, um, is uh, just the set of all b1 to bn minus 1 comma c, such that f of b1 to bn minus 1 plus c is equal to 0. 
which is nothing else than you know, this B times the zero set of G, which is non-empty. OK, so the map is indeed surjective. <coughs> so a finite surjective map here. And now the surprising thing is that we have done most of the work. Now we kind of do, do some, uh, basically reduce the, the main statement to this. Is it clear? You Well, I said, you know, actually, it has a zero. It, has, it might have many zeros, no? So, um, I sh I, you know, it has a zero. So, z of g is non-empty. And then uh, this will be non-empty. But in particular, it contains, if you want, it contains the point b times a. OK, now we come to the second part. So, um, so if say x is just equal to a n, then you know it has a, the identity is finite. Then it's clear. So assume it's not equal to a n. So assume that. So assume x is a, in a n is a closed sub variety and uh, okay so and we want to prove that uh, we want to prove it by induction on n X should be non-empty, obviously, because otherwise the statement would also be false. Be false. But um, <clears throat> okay. So let's see. So we want to somehow use. Uh, uh, this case, so you know, x is not equal to a n, so it will be uh, there will be some f in the ideal of x. So, so let f be an element in the ideal of x without zero. Say so maybe we could assume irreducible. So, a priori, you know, as f is, as x is not equal to a n, it follows that the ideal of x does not consist just of zero. So there is an f there, and um, we can then also assume it's irreducible because i x is a prime ideal. So whenever we write f as a product of two factors, one of the two factors must be in the ideal of x. Okay. So we can apply the first part. So there exists a finite subjective morphism uh, say oh, here it's also called pi whatever maybe uh, what I call it. pi from um, the zero set of f to a n minus 1. No? And um, we know that x is uh, contained in the zero set of f. Is closed. We know that the embedding of a 
closed subset into something into uh, of a closed uh, sub variety into a variety is a finite map so the map the the embedding of x into zf is finite so thus uh, if I take, uh, say, pi tilde, which is uh, equal to uh, pi composed with i from x to n minus 1, this is a finite morphism. So we have a finite morphism from uh, x to n minus 1, but Obviously, there's no reason to assume it's surjective. I mean, the point is we can, we want to be able to find once a possibly smaller k such that the map becomes surjective. What? Why is finite um, Because, uh, you know, by definition of uh, finite, uh, so to, to be Finite, we need that, um, what is it? If we look at the, if we have a map uh, from x to y, this will be finite uh, if um, a x is a finite uh, f upper star of a y uh, module or something is finite over this. And um, now, if uh, the map is injective, then it turns out that the pullback is surjective. That's actually a, a homework exercise. And so, therefore, you know, if they are equal, it's certainly one is finite over the other. And then the composition of finite morphisms is finite, so this is finite. So where am I? So this is not necessarily finite, but we can look at the image. Well, <clears throat> we <clears throat> uh, now we can use uh, the induction hypothesis. Why? lies in a n minus 1. By induction on n, we know that there's a finite morphism from y to some a k. Okay. How would I want to call it? It's a finite morphism, finite subjective morphism. Um, so phi from y to a k for some k. Now, <clears throat> this thing is a finite morphism as a map from x to a n minus 1, but actually maps to y. So then we know that uh, if we view it as a map to its image, it's also a finite morphism. Now, that was one of the things we proved. So we have that uh, pi tilde from uh, x to y is finite. And so if I put now, uh, maybe this should have been, uh, if I not now put uh, the thing that we're talking about to be um, phi composed with pi tilde, this is a map from x to a k. This is um, certainly finite as a composition of finite maps. And it's also surjective as a composition of surjective maps. 
because this map, you know, this map was just, uh, you know, we have restricted here on this side to the image, so by definition it's finite, and the other uh, is subjective, and uh, we also have, um, we have a finite subjective morphism here, so, and subjective, and so that proves it. Okay, so this is this Noether normalization theorem. So we want to prove, uh, so we will see uh, in a moment uh, how one can apply this, for instance, to prove that the dimension of An is equal to N if we find the time. Before that, I want to show uh, one more kind of topological property of finite morphisms, that is, uh, you have the statement that if you have a finite morphism and you have a sub, to have two sub-varieties, two irreducible closed subsets in the source, which are one strictly, in, you know, one contained in the other, but strictly contained, they are not equal, then the same holds in the image. It's not, it cannot happen that if you have two sub-varieties, one contained in the other, which are not equal, that they become equal by mapping with a finite map. And this will in particular imply that the fibers of a finite morphism are finite, which is a, you know, a good reason to call it finite. Okay, so let's <clears throat> see that. So, lemma, let uh, say phi from x to y be a finite subjective morphism. So, let, so z strictly contained in W, we close sub-varieties of X, then I have that the image of Z is strictly contained in the image of W. So you don't have the two things become equal if they were not equal to before. So somehow things cannot be contracted. So <clears throat> first we can, so we can restrict the map phi to W. No? So therefore we can assume that X is equal to W. And we can, in the target, we can restrict uh, the map to the image of W. It still is a finite map if it was one before, so we can assume that Y is equal to F of W. Okay, so this, simpli this simplifies a little bit. So, in other words, we, the statement would be <clears throat> that, uh, so in other words, so if, if so if uh, Z is strictly contained in X, then F of Z is strictly contained in Y. So where Z in X is a closed subvariety. So I always use variety, so this only makes sense if the things are irreducible. Okay, so we have this tiny simplification. So now we, want, we have to check this. So we have that Z is strictly contained in X. 
So there will be, so this was actually, I changed it from phi to f, but now I may be. So we take, there's no f. You know, here it was called phi, and uh, here it uh, camouflaged itself as an f, but it's still a phi. So let um, g be an element in the x, which is not zero, such that g restricted to z is zero. That means that g is in the ideal of z in, uh, in AX. And you know, we know that uh, if as z is not equal to AX, it's a closed subvariety, there will be some function which vanishes on it. No? That's one of the things we always know. So we take such a thing. We really want to finally use the finiteness and whatever to show that uh, then there will be something similar in the image. So now we again, we have to use the finiteness and we again use this by having this thing with a monic polynomial. So this G will satisfy a monic polynomial over uh, AY. So uh, G satisfies a monic equation say G to the N plus some i equals zero to n minus one, say phi star of a i times g to the i is equal to zero. No? Where the a i are elements in uh, a of y. No, that's uh, what the finiteness tells us. So what do we, so now if we have such a monic equation, we can assume that the degree is as small as possible. So there might be more than one monic equation which is satisfied, we take the one with the smallest possible degree. So if this is the case, in particular, it cannot be true that the whole thing is divisible by g. So the coefficient of g to the zero must be non-zero, because otherwise we could just divide the thing by g. So we have phi star of a zero is non-zero. So it follows that phi star a0 is different from 0. No, otherwise, divide by g. And we get a monic equation of smaller degree. Because g is, after all, non zero. We can certainly divide by it. OK. So, but now we can bring this thing to the other side. So it means that phi star of A0, if we bring it now to the other side, so this is non-zero, this um, we just, if we take it out, we can divide by G. And so if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is just equal to minus G times G to the N minus one plus sum I equals one to N minus one phi star of a i g to the i minus one. So we have just you know, brought you know, this phi star of the zero to the other side, and then we obviously can divide by g, and so we get this. But you know, we see that this thing is divisible by g. So if this thing is divisible by G, it means 
that it vanishes on Z. No, because G vanishes on Z. But if, you know, phi star is just ob obtained by taking A0 composed with phi. If A0 composed with phi vanishes on Z, it means that A0 vanishes on phi of Z. But so what have we found? We have found a non-zero element in, so this is a non-zero element. A0 is a non-zero element in AY, which vanishes on phi of, of Z. So it means that phi of Z is not equal to Y. Okay. And that proves it. So we somehow, so we find just that the constant coefficient of this thing must vanish on the image. So the thing is not equal to, okay. And now uh, as a corollary, we get the thing that I mentioned. So if, um, so again, phi from x to y is a finite subjective morphism. Then all the fibers of phi are finite. are finite. Okay, this is quite simple. It follows basically directly from the statement here. So, you know, that the fibers are finite is equivalent to the statement that every irreducible component of a fiber is a point. No, because uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 an algebraic set has finitely many irreducible components, and if each of them is a point, then it's finitely many points. Okay, so so it's enough to show so every irreducible component. of say phi to the minus one of y, where y is a point in y is a point. Well, that's very similar. It's very simple. So I call this component maybe large z. So we take a point small z in large z. Then, obviously, the image of the small z is a y, which is the same as the image of the large z. If you want, you can also put brackets around it to make it into a set. So, by this statement, if they are equal, if the images are equal, the things you started with were equal. And that's all. Okay, so this was the whole story. Okay, so that was as much as I wanted to do for now about uh, finite morphisms, and now we want to apply it to study dimension. Okay. So 
So I maybe should recall. Hope I have it. So I should recall the definition of dimension. Um, so So if X is a variety, then uh, so if I have a chain that um, empty set different from X0 contained in X1 <coughs> and so on until Xn, be a chain of irreducible closed subsets in X. So we just call this a chain in X. And uh, N, we would call the length of the chain. I mean, strictly speaking, there are n plus one elements, but we call the length n. Okay, so then, so actually I call this, not call, I will write just x0, x1, and so on until xn, a chain in x. And n will be its length. <coughs> And then the dimension of X is, um, it's not uh, precisely correct in the notes, so it's called the dimension of X. So this will be uh, either the maximum, the maximal N, that such a, such that we have a chain in X, if such a maximum exists. and infinity otherwise. So if one, you know, in, in, in analysis one would say it's the supremum of the length of the chain. Now, it's a bit strange, and that's why I also wrote it slightly incorrectly in the notes, that we know that we have a, if we have a descending chain of closed subsets, it will be finite. So in that sense, one would think there would be always such a maximum, but in theory, in a priori, this is not obvious, because it could be that every chain is finite, but there might be chains of bigger and bigger lengths for one given set. We will see that this is actually not true. So we will, we will, we will prove that all quasi-projective varieties have a finite dimension. But until we prove that, we cannot use it in our arguments. So we, for a while, have to pretend we don't know that because we, after all, don't know it yet. Yes? What? In, no, 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 infinite. I don't know why I, I, don't know why I wrote empty set. Yeah. Ah, no, certainly not zero. I mean, another question is what kind of dimension you want to, this I didn't dwell on, what kind of dimension one wants to give the empty set? And, uh, could yeah, I think the most reasonable thing to say that for the empty set it should be minus one. Okay? That, um, uh, that fits uh, best with uh, 
with the formulas. So, and I mean, to deal with this infinite for a while, we say that obviously infinity is <laughs> smaller equal to infinity. And uh, uh, if n is in z, then n is smaller, and in particular smaller equal to infinity. Okay? You know, if we want to write down. Uh, and so note that. So remark. So if um, hmm, x, uh, well, no, I mean, we don't write this. I will use it. <coughs> so now let's look at the following lemma. So we want to somehow show some basic things about uh, dimension. The first one is we would like to show, to show that if we have a closed subvariety in a variety, then its dimension is smaller. Okay. This is, however, will a priori be not be entirely true because we might have some trouble with infinity. But uh, apart from that, it is. So let uh, y, so first let y in x be a closed subvariety. Uh, then the dimension of y is smaller or equal to that of x. And uh, if uh, the inclusion is strict and the dimension of y is not infinite, uh, then the dimension of y is strictly smaller than that of x. Okay. Later, we will prove that um, all varieties have finite dimensions, so that uh, so if we have a strict inclusion, this just says that if we have a strict inclusion, then the dimension of the smaller one is smaller. No, but for the moment, we are not yet there. And the second statement is let uh, f from x to y be a surjective closed morphism of varieties, then the dimension of x is bigger equal to the dimension of y. Okay. So, so let uh, if y0 so um, to say y k is a chain in y then we can then it's also a chain in X. And thus, the dimension of X is bigger equal to that of Y. Because the fact to, to prove that the dimension of X is bigger equal to that of Y, we need that for every chain in Y, we find one in X which is at least as long. And we can just take the, the same, no? Because it says, and this, this holds independent of whether some of them is infinite or not. So, um, on the other hand, so if now, but uh, if now Y is strictly contained, in X, we can even get another chain, then 
y0, y1, and so on, yk, strictly contained in x, is a chain in x. So that means for every chain in y, we can find a chain in x which is longer. So if the dimension of y would be infinite, this wouldn't pr really prove anything. But if the dimension is finite, then you know, we take the chain which is you know, such that the, the k is the dimension, and we find the dimension of x is larger. This is one. Yeah. A second is um, a bit more, takes slightly more effort, but it's not a big deal. <coughs> Maybe. So again, so we want to show that the dimension of y, if x is bigger or equal to that of y, so that is, we want to find for every chain in y, a chain in x which is at least as long. That's enough. So let um, say yn be a chain in y. So what we want to do is show uh, that there, there exists a chain uh, in x. So x0 strictly contained in x1 and so on. Um, in x such that uh, well, just if I take f of xn is equal to yn. So, I mean, the fact that f of xn is equal to yn will imply that this is always strict, you know, because they are different. And then we have found a chain of at least the same length as the corresponding chain in y, so the dimension of x is bigger or equal to that of y. Okay, and so we do it. So we use induction on n. So anyway, if n is equal to, to 0, well, we can just take a, a inverse image of x0 or something, then it's, anyway, it's easy. Um, anyway, we'll see that. But now let's, uh, we assume otherwise. Um, what? What? Yeah, yeah. So n equals 0 is clear. So otherwise, so we do induction on n. So let z1 to whatever, zr, be the irreducible components of um, the inverse image of uh, y n minus 1. So the point is that uh, I mean, in theory, we could just think we take as uh, the xi the inverse image of the yi, but that wouldn't be allowed because we need these things are always irreducible. So we have to take irreducible components. But um, you know, you know that the union of the zi of the f of zi is equal to yn minus one and they are closed. Uh, 
and uh, y n minus 1 is irreducible. So it follows that one of them must already be equal to, uh, <coughs> to this. So thus one of the f of ci is equal So we can just take this thing. So then, so maybe I, so for, for some i, it's equal to that. And then for this i, we have a chain So, so this so that means f of c i. So if I take the map now, if I take f from z i to uh, y n minus one, this is now a subjective closed morphism. And so we do indeed, um, anyway, now we can apply the induction hypothesis and see that there is, you know, we, we are in the situation, we just start now with y n minus 1. We make induction over n. Now we have a length of chains. So thus, by induction, uh, there are... Um, um, so we get a chain uh, x0 is contained in x1 and so on and as xn minus 1 we take this zi is a chain in x with uh, f of xi is equal to yi. Well, OK. And then uh, so here I write f of xn. But I, what I meant, obviously, yeah. So I'm sorry, but this is not written correctly, no? I want that f of xi is equal to yi for all i. Because then it means we really have a chain here. Oh. OK. So now we have this until n minus 1. And then for the last one, we just have um, Um, then, you know, we have that if we take x0 so the last one xn is always x so the last one is um, is a chain with um, so uh, f of xi is equal to yi for all i. So I mean, here we just have taken the previous chain. We have left out the, the last one. And now we put the last one back. And by definition, we have that the map from x to y is a finite subjective morphism. OK. And now um, this will allow us to prove not a finite subjective, a, a subjective closed morphism. Now, finally, we can use this to prove that finite subjective morphisms preserve the dimension. 
So we see that if we have a closed trajective morphism, the uh, dimension of the source is bigger or equal to that of the target. And finite morphisms are closed. And finite trajective morphisms are closed and trajective. And uh, so we have to show that also the other inclusion holds. So <clears throat> let, so this is, I call theorem. Let f from x to y be a finite subjective morphism. Morphism of varieties, then the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of y. So we know already that um, the dimension of x is bigger equal to the dimension of y because uh, f is uh, subjective and closed. So we have to show the other inequality. The dimension of y is bigger or equal to that of x. So that is, for every chain in x, we must find a chain in y which has the same length. So let x0, xn be a chain in x. So let for all i, let uh, yi to be just the image of xi. And the claim is y0 contained in y1 to yn is a chain in y, which then proves the dimension of y is bigger or equal to that of x. So the main point is that you have to show that these inequalities are strict. No? That none of them become equal. Um, but um, this is true. Note that yi is always strictly contained in yi plus 1 because, uh, because this is true for the xi. And uh, we had proven that finite morphisms preserve strict inclusion of closed subvarieties. So indeed, the inclusions here are all strict, and the yi are irreducible as images of something irreducible. So this is indeed a chain in y of length n. And so this um, proves this. <laughs> ah. Yeah, now my 
task, which I don't have very much time. The next task is indeed to prove that the dimension of a n is equal to n. So let's see how I can go about this. So this is now, we want to apply what we know so far to, to prove that, which then will also prove that at least all affine varieties have finite dimension. So theorem. The first statement is the dimension of a n is equal to n. Somehow, obviously, that's a very basic thing. If this were not true, then we would have chosen the wrong definition. Because obviously, it makes no sense to have a notion of dimension which doesn't give the obvious dimension to the obvious thing. OK? Um, <clears throat> so we will, again, also compare with hypersurfaces. So let f in k x1 to xn. Uh, um, be an irreducible polynomial. Then the dimension of uh, the zero set of f, well, we want it to be 1 less is n minus 1. No? So z of f. Okay, so if we take the zero set of one equation, it has dimension one less. And the third one, which is rather simple, conversely, um, any subvariety x in a n of dimension n minus 1 is a hypersurface. So if I have a subvariety of a n which has dimension n minus 1, it's a 0 of 1 polynomial. Well, because, um, OK. You see, well, I will just start. So first I do something which I call implication of 1 to 2, but we will actually also need it in the proof of part 1, which is that we, uh, which, is, which will be the statement that uh, we want to prove that the dimension of a hypersurface is the same as the dimension of a n minus 1. OK? Which one are equivalent? No, these are, not equi these are things that we prove, three statements. So it has nothing to do with equivalent. No, We prove that dimension of a n is n. We prove that, yeah, yeah. But the point is, just I shouldn't maybe call it like that. You know, we want to prove all these statements. And, uh, you know, we, we will prove something that once we have proven one, we'll prove two. Okay? But it's a bit more tricky because in the proof of one, we will use this statement. <laughs> okay? So what I really mean is just, so we first, so uh, first proof uh, that the dimension of a zero set of f of such a polynomial is equal to the dimension of a n minus 1. OK? So once we have proven 1, this will prove 2. But you know, first we have to prove 1. So why is that? So this is quite simple. So let f be a uh, non-zero polynomial. 
then there exists a finite subjective morphism Uh, from the zero set of f to a n minus one. This was the Newton normalization theorem. So thus it follows that the dimension of zf is equal to the dimension of a n minus one. Maybe I don't call it one implies two. This is what we use. But it means that now we don't have to prove two anymore. Once we, once we prove one, two is automatic. What? No, non-constant. Otherwise, not, no? If it's constant, it will be empty, and then... Uh, <laughs> you know, hypersurface, you always need that... Uh, that it's not constant. So, so we can, now we want to prove one, which is the main step. And uh, we cannot maybe quite do it now, but I can um, prove at least the trivial direction. So let, say, I take, zi to be the zero set of, uh, say, you know, f x, f the, var the variables are called x i, so x uh, i plus one until x n in a n. So for instance, x uh, z zero, z zero will be just the zero set of all the variables, so it will be the point zero and z uh, n will be this there will be nothing here this will be a n so uh, so then z i is isomorphic to a to the i and thus so in particular it's irreducible and thus we have that c0 strictly contained in C1, strictly contained in C2, and so on. Is a chain in N of length N so it follows that the dimension of A N is bigger equal to n. Well, maybe now we'll try, even the converse direction is not very long, it's only slightly surprising. So we want to prove the opposite inequality. No. So, I mean, if I put here from xn, so it's maybe you don't like the notation, but it's, you know, it's like you would do if you write a sum in a, in a program or something. You know, it's going up from this to this. So if this one is bigger than this, there's nothing. So, so x, xn minus one would be z of xn and z and so I, I mean, anyway, Zn is supposed to be just a zero set of nothing. Yeah? And then Zn minus 1 is Z of Xn. Zn minus 2 is Z of Xn minus 1 Xn, and so on. I mean, this is, if ever you have written a, a program in which there are sums, you will notice that you are allowed to do it that way. <laughs> If the lower index is bigger than the upper index, then the sum is empty and the same here. Okay? So we prove the opposite inequality. So 
by induction on n. It's always induction. So for n equal to 0, it is trivial because a0 is a point, and it certainly has dimension 0. We can only find a, cho a chain of length 0. So now let x0 strictly contained in x1 and so on, say xk minus 1, which we call x, strictly contained in the n, be a chain in the n. However, we don't know what this number k is that we want to find out. No, we want to find out that this number would have to be smaller or equal to n minus 1. Anyway, now. So we know that uh, then obviously x in is strictly contained in n minus 1 is a closed subset, closed subvariety. So the ideal of x will be non empty. So I can find a polynomial, f, which is non zero, which lies in the ideal of x. So let f in the ideal of x be irreducible. So first I can find a non-zero element, and then I can maybe write it. If it's not irreducible, I write it as, and it's written as a product of two factors, then one of the two factors must lie in this prime idea. So I can find an irreducible element, as I used it before. So then x is contained in the zero set of f. Now we somehow have to use the part, uh, I mean, the, 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 the part two, no? F, thus, you know, the dimension of X is smaller or equal than that of the zero set of F. So um, it follows that K minus one is smaller or equal to the dimension of the zero set of f, which is equal to the dimension of a n minus one. No, but we um, which is a small. Let me try again. <clears throat> Um, now we had found that the dimension of the zero set of f is equal to the dimension of a n minus one. No? That was what we had said. That is what's written here. Okay, so I'm just using this, and this is equal to n minus one by induction. Okay, so this makes induction quite powerful because we we assume that the dimension of a n minus one is n minus 1 by induction. Okay. So, now, um, so this is, we have such a, so, <coughs> thus, um, So we have that, so k plus 1, k minus 1 is equal to n minus 1. Thus the dimension, so for any chain in x, you know, the length of the chain, the length of the chain is actually equal to k. The length of the chain is at most k. So the dimension of a n is smaller or equal to k. No? 
because uh, we have written any an arbitrary chain and its length is k. No, k minus one plus one, <laughs> which is equal, which is smaller equal to to n. And this is what we wanted to prove. Uh, it's not a contradiction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I will, the third part I will uh, prove next time. This also will give me occasion to review the statement. And then um, so oh, it will be tomorrow. Yeah, so you can, you don't have to look forward it for too much time.